Alexandria, my dear sir, merits your attention. The position it occupies amongst celebrated towns, the scholars it has produced, the monuments that after 2,000 years still announce its past glory, they all have rights upon your curiosity. And it is to satisfy this curiosity that for the past three months I have explored the regions where she stood. Through reading the Greek, Latin and Arab authors, I have learned to recognize her in the midst of the ruins that now cover her. By comparing that which they wrote with the objects before my eyes, I have been able to trace her plan. At Alexandria, one is still shown the place where the sciences were once taught, among which philosophy and astrology, and particularly mathematics, held first rank. They were first taught using hieroglyphics, which were invented by the ancient Egyptians. It was here that Homer, Orpheus, Pythagoras, Plato and other great men studied, and then they took with them to Greece this great knowledge that they had found in Egypt. Marine Estrangin est dessinatrice. Après deux années passées sur le site archéologique de Karnak en Haute-Égypte, où elle a effectué des relevés épigraphiques, elle rejoint en 2004 l'équipe du Centre d'études Alexandrine. Dès son arrivée, elle croque sur le vif, au hasard de ses découvertes et de ses enthousiasmes, les ambiances et le fourmillement d'Alexandrie. La citadelle de Kate Bay, la Bibliothèque Alexandrina, les cimetières, les bords du canal Mermoudeya, le port de pêche, les églises, les mosquées, les jardins de la ville. Alexandria is not a purely oriental town, but has rather more style than visitors tend to allow. Despite the somewhat clumsy European forms that the great houses affect, one can readily tell that one is in Africa. Here, a door is framed with sculpted decoration in the Turkish fashion. There, a mashrabiya allows a glimpse through the fine tracery of a woman in silhouette, watching. Further on, an upper floor overhangs. A house ends in a terrace. A date palm pokes above a wall like a column crowned with a capital of leaves. The houses of this town are generally built of cut stone and stand reasonably high. The streets are narrow and thus allow for the hanging between one roof and the other of reeds or woven mats that protect the citizens from the harsh heat of the sun. There was only the canal left to visit, 
It is barely one quarter of a mile distant. Made to bring water from the Nile to Alexandria, it still performs this service after so many centuries of use, and during the floods it provides this town with a sufficient quantity of water to fill the cisterns. The riding of a donkey is, after all, not a dignified occupation. A man resists the offer at first, somehow, as an indignity. How is that poor little red-saddled long-eared creature to carry you? Is there to be one for you and another for your legs? Since custom demands that one employ these animals, far from denigrating them, one should be delighted. There is no other town in the world where one is better served for moving from place to place than at Alexandria and Cairo. All the streets are full of donkeys, which are at the service of those who do not desire to walk. On the outer edges of Alexandria, there is a great number of gardens in which grow a great quantity of fruits. Oranges, dates, limes, golden shower trees, lemons, figs and bananas but one finds no apples or pears. However, one can find moustiche, which are the apples of Adam. It is said that it is with these apples that Adam infringed God's law. All around the town of Alexandria there are orchards, which present a most agreeable aspect and resemble beautiful, well-wooded forests. They are filled with trees heavy with fruit and with useful plants. The very sight of them calls the passerby to visit them more closely, and once entered, all invites one to rest. Every day I went to the port to look at the fish that live in the mixed waters of the Nile and the sea. It is an indescribable spectacle, and I have never eaten such excellent fish in all the lands that I have visited. One makes barriers to catch the fish, and one places there a trap such that any fish that enters it cannot exit. Thus, they are easily caught. There are piles of them on the quay. The eggs are removed, and the rest is salted and sent to the towns. There are places that are specially designated for selling and buying, what are called bazaars. However, one must not envisage the Palais Royal or the Rue Saint-Honoré. The shops stand in a line and are separated one space from another by very narrow alleys, and they are raised to the height of a sort of parapet of two to two and a half feet where the merchant sits and spreads out his wares. Here my companion and I soon stationed ourselves and watched the novel and curious scene below. And strange indeed to the eye of a European 
when for the first time he enters an oriental city, is all he sees around him. The picturesque dresses, the buildings, the palm trees, the camels, the people of various nations with their long beards, their arms and turbans, all unite to form a picture which is indelibly fixed in the memory. Oh, 